Good afternoon, good evening, or good night, ladies and gentlemen, depending on when you are listening to us. Welcome to Enforcing the Fundamentals with Doug Harding. Uh, don't adjust your sets or your pictures or anything. Doug is on vacation. He's currently, as we're uh, recording this and as you're listening to it, he's in South Africa. He oh. has... He actually got on a plane and went somewhere there is no hockey rinks, although he has promised me he's going to send me a photo. He's going to find an ice hockey rink in Cape Town, um, which, you know what, if anybody can do it, be him. So filling in today is uh, another friend of mine. He's a coach um, in a completely different form of athletics. Uh, as you can see by your name on the screen, his name is Cheeseburger. Uh, you might know him as Brando Little John, or you might know him by a different name, which is appropriate for this podcast. Doug, don't know where it came from, uh, but I do know that we have a circle of friends that absolutely yeah. will call him that. So uh, don't need the story on that right now. Uh <laughs> Cheese is based out of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he runs the Worldwide Dojo. So he has been training professional wrestlers um, for five years. Cheese, why don't you uh, just run down real quick how you got into this? I mean, you're only 30 years old right now. Mm -hmm. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you can do your own math as he tells his story <laughs> here and see exactly one of the similarities that Doug has. He started coaching at a very young age. So uh, how did you end up with the dojo there, Cheese? So I started professional wrestling in general as a student uh in this i'm so i'm actually in my school right now like in my building uh and i started in october 2010 when i was 17 years old at the ring of honor school um and the ring of honor school was in this building with the offices and everything that started under delirious and daisy hayes and they taught me how to be a professional wrestler everything like that um and then just throughout the years because i would all, i would just be here every single class like there's like years where i did not miss a class we would train two or three times a week i would always be here and I just would pick up things. And then it became that I became like my trainers, like I'd be like, hey, we have a new student coming in. Like, can you just go on the outside and just show them like uh, a couple of things, like lead them through the warm ups or like show them like how to lock up, things like that, just basic stuff. Um, and then he would trust me with that while he would teach everyone else. And then it'd be like, hey, uh, my trainer would be like, hey, I have a phone call. I'm going to be running late. Can you get the class started and just like, you know, run through the warm up drills? I'd be like, okay, no problem. And then it'd be like, hey, I can't show up today because like he had like a bunch of other jobs he did for our company, Ring of Honor. Uh, he's like, hey, I can't make it in today. Something came up. Like, can you just run the class today? Here's a bunch of drills that to do. I'm like, okay, so I go through a list of drills and he'd be like, all right, I can't make class today, so just make up your own drills. And it just became a, a, a constant progression to where I eventually became one of the assistant trainers at the Ring of Honor School um, for about three or four years, I would say. But even before that, like I was just teaching on the side like here and there just like i said the progression and uh 2018 uh our company ring of honor was shutting down this building like in the sense of like they were moving the school to baltimore which is like three hours away from where we're at right now um all of my students would not have a place to train uh it's just the commute to baltimore back and forth it just didn't make sense uh just they just didn't make sense at all um so there was going to be no school like in this general area so i thought about it and i was like well uh, I had a, I had an offer to be a trainer at the new school in Baltimore. And I was like, well, I don't want to move to Baltimore because you know Baltimore kind of sucks. But um, <laughs> I was like, uh, I was like, I want to move to Baltimore, and, my, and then I want to leave my students high and dry. So I was like, well, how about just like sign the lease here and just try and reopen the school as my own. And I was like, well, this is either gonna like go really, really like, this might go really bad. Like this might last like I don't know three months. We run out of money and have to shut down anyway. But I was like, I have to at least try. Um, so I bought the ring for Ring of Honor. Uh, I talked to the landlord. I signed the lease over. Uh, and, yeah, we've been going strong ever since for five years. We started in uh, July of 2000 or June of 2018. And, yeah, and we've had a bunch of success. We've had some great students that have gone on to sign contracts, appear on TV, uh, do some cool things in wrestling. And we have always have new students popping in to do, you know, learn wrestling for me, myself, and my group of trainers. And, yeah, it's been it's been a great journey. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. So, I mean, this, this all leads back to, you really started training. It sounds like you were kind of thrown in the deep end, but when you find somebody that can do it, yeah. absolutely take advantage absolutely. of them or, or, you know, use their skills. Okay. I don't want to say take advantage of them because that generally means you're not getting paid <laughs> for it or learning no, anything no, from yeah. them. Well, um, yeah, it'd be like you have someone you trust that be like, Hey, I, I know this person will teach someone the way I want things to be taught. And that happens with some of my students as well, where I'll be like, you know, I'll be, you know, we'll have like, say, a new student that just came in, but they're not like 
uh, in the ring yet. They're just on the outside. So mm-hmm. I'll be teaching people in the ring, but sometimes it's hard to split focus between this person that's on the floor or a group of people that's on the floor, but this people are in the ring. So I'll say, hey, after you do this drill, one of my students, hey, just go on the floor and like show them like just basic stuff, you know, like show them this, like, you know how I want it to be taught, blah, 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 you know. Mm-hmm. No, that's great. Um, now, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to our first episode, but, uh, you know, the regular Doug that sits there, <laughs> he started coaching at 13 because the choice was either the grade six team in his school. Um, they had no coach. I guess the the teacher that was doing it, his pregnant wife said, you're done now. Um, oh, shit. <laughs> so he stepped up as a, as a seventh grader and playing on one team higher. He stepped up at 13 years old and said, well, wow. if it's the difference between them having a team and them not having a team, I'll coach. Mm-hmm. And he did. That's insane. And that's, and that's where he got started. And there's something about being able to pick that up at such a young age, not just getting a grasp on your sport, but being able to, you know, coach others without, um, you know, you don't want to be that drill sergeant mentality. There's yeah. lots of horror stories out there Absolutely. on, you Especially know, wrestling. wrestling training from way back in the day that are mm-hmm. not good. I mean, you, yep. you can look, you don't have to look too far to find those stories. If you, especially if you've ever seen an Undertaker documentary, that one came yeah. out real oh, good. About Buzz Sawyer. Yeah. You talked yep. about that. Uh, about Buzz Sawyer. And it, you know, and even before that, I, I mean, Hulk Hogan has his leg broken day one because oh, yeah. they just needed to make sure. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Right? And yeah. yeah, so when you're talking about way back in the days, I mean, obviously it's different now. It's the schools are a lot more reputable out there. But th- uh, the point is, be, well, OK, yeah, fair, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. There are there are, there are some with much better reputations yes, these definitely, days. Definitely. Um, oh, I've heard yes. good things about um, one out in Calgary run by Lance Storm, but I believe that's now finished. Yeah, um, that, that, that was a great that school was uh, fantastic. Uh, and that produced so many stars. Uh, and it sucked, too, because like I, if I remember correctly, Lance got a job as a producer for WWE, and that's why he shut down the school. And then COVID hit, and he got fired like two months after that. And it was just like, you know, it was kind of like a yeah. really poor timing. But his school like was around for years and produced so many like incredible like wrestlers. Oh, ab- absolutely. And you know, people can look that up and figure it out. Um, but it great, a gr- absolutely great reputation. Um, I I think Lance Storm is one of my all time favorites. Uh, yeah. But it, as a coach, it would be interesting to hear about his sort of technique. Now, I'm sort of looking over here at your at your school's website, and something caught my eye here, and I want to be able to read it. Uh, yes, there it is. We're not trying to convince anyone they'll be superstars. You will get out of wrestling what you put in. Yes. We Absolutely. you we cannot guarantee and will not guarantee your success. All we can do is guarantee that you will receive proper training and safety fundamentals from knowledgeable minds in the mm-hmm. business of professional wrestling. Yes. Now, I like that because in any form of athletics, and we've discussed this at length here on this show, is there is a funnel effect. Not everybody that starts is going to have the skills or the drive or the capability of getting to that top level. And everybody wants the top level where the several commas in the check. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, whether you're in, you know, football, proper football, uh, hockey, <laughs> basketball, baseball, anything like that, you start and you, if you don't put anything in, you're not getting anything out. Absolutely. And you, you, a lot of people think if I start playing, I'm just going to, I'll go, I'll be in the NFL. I'll be in the NHL. I'll be in the NBA. It, it, it don't work like that. Mm-hmm. It just, it doesn't. And one yes. of the foundations um, dad has is you're going to leave this eventually. Nobody yes. plays until they're 90 at a competitive <laughs> level. Yeah you're going to have a lot of life left. So we're going to sh- teach you some life lessons along the way. Um, you know, just in the nature of me growing up, I would end up with a lot of friends that are like, you look familiar, you look familiar and it would drive them mental. And for a while I just would, I wouldn't say anything. And it's like, you play hockey, don't you? <laughs> and like, and that's when they can, they look at me and they go, and they just do that. Like, yeah, Scooby Doo like painting overlap, and it's like, oh my god, you're Doug's son. I didn't know Greg had a brother, 
And it was like, yeah. And then it's like, well, yeah, I did. And your dad taught me so much that I, I, I stopped playing hockey because I, I hit the ceiling. Um, it wasn't good enough to advance. Uh, life got in the way. I got hurt. Whatever reason it is, they just, and it's like, but I've learned so much about work ethic and drive. Do you see a lot of that coming and going in your school? When somebody's showing up, do you see them leaving one way or the other with a better understanding about how to deal with life in general on the way out? And how do you facilitate that yourself? Um, to go to start with like the kind of first point you brought up about like not guaranteeing success and everything. One of my big pet peeves, I have a lot of them, but like one of my big ones is like when I see schools like advertising, like we'll make you like the next like big thing, like the next like, superstar, or, like blah, blah, blah. And like, I feel like it's just like, I could do that and I would probably make a lot more money doing that by promising people they'll be superstars and like, hey, but like I morally, I feel like that's just like the wrong way of going about things. Because, you know, like, you know, like the chances of just someone joining a wrestling school and being, let's say, like main event at WrestleMania. It's like it's like this. You have a better chance, of like winning the lottery. Like, in all honesty, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, no. Um, and that's that. And that's that's a yeah. very similar across the board. Right. Not yeah, everybody's going to like get their name on the cup. Hockey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like it's like you have a, you also have a better chance of winning a lottery because just like most people just don't end up that. Um, most people end up in either quitting or they end up having like a solid career, or maybe they make it on the top, or maybe they make it to just having a consistent role on TV. Which is like, if you can do that, mm-hmm. that's just like you're already like in the upper one percent of wrestlers, even if you never made it, made it. But just having a job on TV and being under contract, you're already in like the upper one percent, you know, um, mm-hmm. of like thousands of wrestlers, but. Um, I hate seeing that with schools because I feel like it just sets things up for disappointment and gives people kind of a false, a false sense of what's going to happen. Um, like I said, the only thing I can guarantee people is that I can get them quality training. I can, you know, train them as safely as possible, um, focus on their fundamentals, like their character, their promos. I can get them proper training, but I can't I can't guarantee anyone's going to be successful because you can do like wrestling so weird because you can do all the right things. You can be in good shape. You can be a great promo. You can be uh, great in the ring. You have charisma, everything. And just like not just get it, like just not make it. It's weird. Mm -hmm. You just sometimes it's just right time, right place, the right person to see you at the right time. And a lot of it's honestly luck. Um, Obviously, I'd be prepared. But if you're prepared and you're, you're lucky, then like that's when things like kind of happen. But mm-hmm. there's just sometimes you're just in the right, the wrong place at the wrong time. You just you just don't get seen by the right people, and it sucks. But that's just kind of how it is. Um, or you can do everything wrong and still get a job. It's weird. You know, it's, it's like so strange. Um, yeah. I mean, I I, I had a, a an old boss used to say a lot. Luck is preparation meeting opportunity. And yes, that's the that's the that's the phrase I was looking for. Yeah, luck is preparation is like preparation meeting opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just like you have to be. When the opportunity presents itself, you have to be as ready as possible um, and just you have to just go for it. But like you can also just be, be the perfect wrestler and just something just doesn't that opportunity just pass you by. Or maybe like you were ready at one point, but then when that opportunity does come, maybe you're like too. maybe like the company that's looking at you like, oh, you're too old. We wish we would have seen you like five years ago, you know, something mm-hmm. like that. But that's a whole other thing. But in terms of just going to the other thing about like life lessons and things like that. Like, you know, you have to, like, as a trainer, it's not just, like, what you teach in the ring. It's out of the ring as well, as well even though it's professional wrestling. But we are, like, mentors to people. And we, you know, students do go through real-life issues. And sometimes we have to be just that, either that voice of reason to, like, talk to them about something or just that person that just listens to them, um, which I which I find. Uh, and I feel like I have a good relationship with a lot of my students where they feel like they can trust me to come to me with their issues. But wrestling and uh not wrestling related you know like um personal issues that they're going through that may be mm-hmm. affecting their career or just things that they just want to talk about um or like maybe they have an issue in wrestling where it's like how do i deal with the situation like what's the proper way to go about this business or sometimes you have the opposite side where like they do something wrong and then someone tells me about it and then i have to talk to them about it and we have to have that uncomfortable conversation where it's like hey uh, this is not the right way to go about things but um mm-hmm. it's not just being a trainer it's being a mentor and that's not that's just just being there for people not necessarily mm-hmm. forcing that upon people but just being there like hey if any if, if you guys need to talk about anything like you know just feel free to come in the office at any time yeah and that's that's a great philosophy that's something we have covered here uh, and talk about it frequently 
is you have to be aware of your 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 athletes, your students as human beings because different than you know a professional uh, a professional sport with an off season, you guys don't have one. You have an right. off season when you make your own off season uh unless you you know get that big uh, corporate company contract yes. where you get the off season when they say you get the off season mm -hmm. i mean there's there's a certain level where you just you've signed that contract you've signed those dates uh, correct yep. me if i'm wrong Absolutely. and i say this to to doug all the time if i'm talking out of my ass and i'm wrong cut me off uh, no that's correct like, uh it's just uh, like you when you're under a contract you're most of the time beholden to um what dates they want you on when uh, most companies uh, are pretty good about if you ask for time off, if, you know, they'll usually accommodate you in some capacity. Uh, but for the most part, you know, if a company is like, hey, we need you at this date and you're under contract, like you have to be there at that date. Even if mm -hmm. they like just need you to sit in catering for whatever reason, because that happens a lot. But it's just like if they need you for that date, they like they if you're under contract, that's what you, you have to do. Yeah, they want you in that building. And, you know, different from, you know, a lot of a lot of other sports is it's a constant travel it's not home and away games i mean if you're lucky <laughs> i mean you're in the you're in the northeast u.s and there's that's a really tight bunch of cities big market cities yes. in there so something like that can be uh, quite advantageous i mean i've i i've seen your schedule and you you posting dates uh and also a, a few other people who you know we won't name drop on the show but you you know the the mm -hmm. Dominican fellow I'm talking about and <laughs> his the way his schedule goes and yes. it's it's fun seeing you guys being able to do all these things and having finally got the lay of the land about a year and a half ago of going out there for a visit I'm like oh wow these places are way closer together than I thought oh, yeah. um, it's and it just We're absolutely fascinates happy. me. We're but afraid. I mean, it's life does happen. You're gonna get sick. You're gonna have family members get sick. You're gonna get hurt. Like yeah. it, I, and I know this. This might be a bit of a, a, a hockey centric audience that may be kind of rolling their eyes and it's like, "What is this going on today?" But these, it, you're gonna get hurt. It's a physical yeah. business. Yes, it's a very. It's, it's hard funny. to understand unless you've really yeah. looked at it for a long time. Oh yeah. Um, uh, did, did you see? Uh, it was a recent quote. I don't remember the exact quote. I got. I have to look it up. But um, Tyson Tyson Fury talking about like. Uh, his little stint in pro wrestling with WWE, mm -hmm. where he said, like, he, like, Tyson Fury, the literal best boxer in the world at the highest level, said, no, with no hyperbole, that he found that pro wrestling was much harder than boxing. Like, mm -hmm. he said, like, he, he, like, and that's, like, the best. That's not just, like, some, like, all right, this guy's just kind of, like, it's, like, the best in the world was saying that it was harder for him to, to prepare and get in the wrestling ring and do wrestling than it was, like, for boxing. And, like, just for him to provide our sport with like that level of respect was like and incredible. Like for someone like it uh, from some uh, coming from someone like him. Yeah. And that's, that's something I enjoy seeing is when once in a while, these, these big name athletes from other sports, whether it's Tyson Fury or uh, Shaquille O'Neal coming in and they're like, Whoa, this was, this was, this was way different than I expected. You know, some yes. of them do well, some of them do not. And I mean, it is what it is. Lawrence Taylor is probably one oh, yeah. of the first ones I remember yeah. actually seeing. I mean, I'm sure I could look back and see a few more, but it was like the biggest one I feel like at, at the earliest because we had um Cindy Lauper, but she didn't like get mm -hmm. in the ring. Um, but yeah, Lawrence Taylor was the first like real big like celebrity because actually, uh, because they had Muhammad Ali fight Anoki, but that might have been after that. I can't remember when that was. Yeah, I don't remember when that was, but I know Ali was also a ref at, and, and I, and they even, it wasn't even, a, they advertised him as a ref for um, WrestleMania one, but he just ended up being like an outside enforcer. Yeah. And I can't remember who I heard tell the story of what it was, but it was just something. Oh, wait, was, was Mr. T with Roddy Piper? That might have been, that was before Lawrence Taylor. Yes. Yes, yes. it was. So that was WrestleMania one. So, I mean, Mr. Oh, T who okay. came in as a boxer and you're yeah. thinking, what's this a muscle bound actor going to do now? It's back in the eighties, right? This was, this was about the time I got hooked. I was still a little too little to, to really grasp, you know, Oh, this show's on at this time. But, if it was ever on, I 
planted my ass in front of the TV. Yep. Uh, you know, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. The go to the video stores just just became a thing, and it's like, oh my god, Mister T from the A Team is on the video box right. with Hulk Hogan. I'm taking yeah. this home, and my parents are like, again, again, really? You're right. Um, <laughs> So it's and you know Mr. D I believe was very complimentary towards the the sport oh, yeah. as a whole and he came in you know as an actor but a boxing background as well. Yes. If I if I recall correctly. Yeah, they have Brody Piper had that like boxing match or something. Oh yes, that yeah. the the boxing match. Yeah, yeah. I remember like if you watched the Lawrence Taylor match you could see like he you know was Lawrence Taylor one of the best football players like ever he's just, like Pro wrestling has a different level of like cardio. He's just, like blown, like blown up early on, and mm -hmm. Bam Bam Bigelow's having to get him through the match. It's, it's crazy, yeah. But uh, it's cool. It's when like athletes uh, or actors or musicians come, like give respect to like pro wrestling. Yeah, Not and you know we're from another level from coaching. You know, and we're seeing this on a on a whole interesting level with you know with uh, Logan Paul as well. But mm -hmm. I, I don't get to get in with that because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll something happened that i have an opinion on and uh it's uh he, and I, logan paul's tremendously respectful i believe his quote was uh, everybody was talking about this and then i watched the footage and i'm like yeah i saved ray mysterio but i also might have just about killed ray mysterio yeah yeah i saw the clip of that where he's talking yeah because he's like i yeah i was it, it basically i was two feet out of position yeah um but it and you know what he's given lots of respect to it as well and he's working his ass off uh, so uh, that's okay. that's fantastic like really for. now you don't get to be a young coach without some good coaching and i know was it last year you were down learning from a whole different set of coaches down in mexico oh no uh, uh earlier this year in the April, earlier this year May, last, march and april yep march so last spring that's mm -hmm. right um so You've obviously had some good coaches in ROH. What's your been experience? And you did you get any coaching in Japan as well? Were you? No, I know you've been I over there a few times. I I sadly didn't get to train at the dojos there because I I would only the times I went over I would only be out there for like five days at a time, so it would be like mm -hmm. very quick trips. Um, like I I would I wanted to like stay for like a month, two, three months, just to like train at the dojo and learn from them. But uh, sadly, I didn't materialize. So it's just kind of like. It's like, hey, you're just straight up talent. Like, you're getting in, you're doing the show, and you go home. I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. But, uh, but I did get like uh, advice and stuff like that from some of the, the wrestlers too. So that was cool. All right. So, talk to me about your being coached up in Mexico. Tell me mm -hmm. what what kind of coaching, and in, you know, in general, what kind of coaching has really helped you bring your your training, your coaching game along. Mm -hmm. Um, Mex man, yeah, Mexico is a whole different like different animal, uh, and. I had wanted to go to Mexico for a while and I had wanted to learn, like I, I had been trained in Lucha Libre, but like, I never was like in Lucha Libre. Like I was like when I was down in Mexico. So Bandito, uh, for those that don't know, Bandito has like a, a gym in Mexico and there's like uh, apartments, like er everything's like in the gym. There's like a ring. You have like 24 hour access to the ring. There's a full commercial gym, like a plant fitness on the ground floor. You have 24 hour access to, um, there's like a kitchen, there's like a living room, uh, like showers, everything, like laundry, and then on the upper level, there's like twenty apartment, uh, twenty apartments, like twenty like dorm rooms. So people mm -hmm. can go there and they can, you know, pay for like a room and like live live at the gym and like train there. Um, so I was like, I have time, like I have time. I want to go down there for a month. So it just ended up working out. The timing. Uh, I talked to Bandito about. It. He's like, yeah, please, like come. So I went there and trained. I was like, I want to wrestle in Mexico. I want to learn like the authentic art of lucha libre. And yeah, it's just like. My first day is like right into the deep end. Uh, thankfully, I was like, like I said, I was trained in Lucha uh, in America as well. So I like, I didn't feel super out of place, but there were so many things where it's just like their training is very much like go, go, go. And like the coaches, they were all great. Like I learned from a bunch of different coaches. Uh, I learned from a guy named Skyda, who's a, like one of the greatest coaches of all time, like trained at legends in like Japan, Mexico, America, like uh, helped train Orange Cassidy, helped train like Drew Gulak, Tracy Williams, Chris Hero, Claudio Castagnoli. Uh, delirious like the list goes like on and on and on um known like throughout the world but i really want to learn from skyda and he was like one of the main trainers there so i got to learn so much from him but in mexico yeah it's just like go 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 like they'll show you like and it's like super hot down there in the gym like the gym doesn't have ac and it was mm -hmm. like uh um it was like sweltering and you know the train be like usually in between two to three hours um so like my first class there i was like it was like me and one other like a uh, guy from Canada, actually from a uh, 
I think he might have been from Vancouver. Uh, okay. Right. He's I like him already. I think he was. I think he's from BC. I want to say. I'll, uh, his name's like. Uh, I think his ring name is Brett Matthews. Maybe. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, I think it's Brett Matthews. I know just his first name Brett. I gotta double check if he's from Vancouver or not. Um, but like he was, he was the uh, Canadian there, and um, uh, Eli Eisen was there. Who's he had went to Mexico a year before. Was telling me about it. He was down there, but he was sick that first week. So my first class, I went in there not knowing like anybody, and Brett was the only other person that spoke English. So I was just like kind of like next to him, and. I'm like, I'm just like watching because especially being like a trainer, like now I'm like, all right, I don't want to mess anything up and like have the trainers like have to like correct me. So I'm just like, I'm watching intently. I want to watch and watch. And then like anytime I mess something up, the trainers were always super helpful. Be like, oh, do it like this and like change this and like then I like, you know, get it. And but it was just like, just go, go, go. And it would be like, we would do a, a short drill, then do it again with something onto it, then something again with something onto it. So by the mm -hmm. end of the class, we had this like long sequence we have to remember. Um, they got me out of my comfort zone in terms of doing things like, uh, back flipping and like front flipping and like different like twists and stuff like that uh, it was it was incredible um and the, the training was very intense because also in mexico city where uh the gym was uh the altitude is much higher so you're that messes you up more than anything uh so it took me like my first like two three weeks there my cardio was like i it was just getting used to like the air and like the the elevation of the air i remember just like getting to the gym and, like I would walk up like three flights of stairs to get to the top level, and I'd be like, "Ooh, like I'm like out of breath. Like, what the what is going on here?" <laughs> and then like, yeah, it's it's thin air. It's like Denver, right? Like, yes, um, yeah, yeah, just like that. Yeah, exactly. I've I've uh, never had the pleasure of either, but that sounds awful. When uh, I came back home, my cardio was like the best it ever been, so that was great. But just like the first like two weeks, it was an adjustment period, and um, I learned from a uh, Flamita who I knew from Ring of Honor. Um, so like my first like three my first two sessions uh no one like knew who i was there was kind of like i could see like the guys that were like that were at the gym they were kind of like, looking at me because again like eli was sick so he couldn't like really introduce me mm -hmm. to anybody. so i was just kind of there just like the only like real american there um so i could see people kind of like looking at me like all right let's see what this guy can do and then like after like i didn't like get do everything correctly but most of the stuff i like would was able to do and like get get down like the technical stuff especially i was like solid at um and then i guess then the guys would come up to me like hey brother like where are you from like oh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, i'm from new jersey like you know like you know coming like living at the gym blah blah, blah. and we then we kind of started building that camaraderie and then my third session i had my first class with flamita who i knew from ring of honor and he had done you know in mexico lived in japan trained in japanese dojos and his training was like a, a mix of lucha libre and japanese dojo training so we would start like his sessions with like like a 30 minute to like an hour, like hard, like workout. And this would be like at like noon in the middle of like when the sun's like just beaming down like at its gym. peak. Yeah. Yeah. And we would do like crawl, we do like a CrossFit workout beforehand and we'd be all dead and be like, all right, it, our, his classes were supposed to be like two hours, but it usually be for anywhere between like two hours to like four hours, just depending on when he just like ran out of stuff to do or just mm -hmm. stop. So like there's one day we were training like for like four hours, like the heat and it was as intense as hell. Um, but like my third day, uh, we had like everyone sat down. And I sat next to one of the guys who would translate for me. And Flamita would just like he was talking to the class and he's like, Hey, everyone, like this is Cheeseburger. He's from Ring of Honor. He did like New Japan. He did all that. He came down to Mexico to like learn Lucha Libre, like welcome to the gym, everything. And that's when all the guys were like, Oh, okay, this guy's like been around and like done some stuff. And they could see like I knew what I was doing for like in ring stuff. But then that's when all the guys we, we started talking and kind of building up that bond because they're like, Flamita introduced me to everybody. But yeah, the train in Mexico is amazing. Uh, I really want to go back next year and do another month there. Uh, and the lessons I learned there, I've been bringing to my school and showing my students. That's that's fantastic. Um, now, for for those of that may not be familiar, the Mexican style um, is very different. It's very yes. it's from very different. For the Mexican versus the U.S. style. Um, the Mexican is very fast paced, lots mm -hmm. of, lots of, um, drags, lots short of sprints, splits. I guess, throwing yeah, your body in the air. Forth. Um, acrobatics is yep, a big much. thing. Uh, whereas the Japanese is a bit more hard hitting, mm -hmm. uh, probably the closest thing to a legitimate fight. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, there's, there's something yes. to say about the British style as well, where they're just trying to tie you in a knot. Um, mm -hmm. but the Japanese, it, it, it's as close to completely full contact as you're ever going to see. Absolutely. Um, they're not, they're not going to, to pull the punch again, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're also not going to drop you on your head and paralyze you. So they're going to find, right. they're well, going to get as close like, to that like, line as possible. 
Yes. Right. And that's um, and, and that's an interesting mix. And it's one of those mixes that has been around forever because there's something about the way Mexico and Japan have always seemed to have cooperated where you see guys like, you know, like a Chris Jericho, like an Ultimo Dragon yeah. uh, would go back and forth a lot. Um, and that not was like getting... a thing. Oh, sorry. No, no. no go ahead. That, that was like a thing for me. Like all of my favorite wrestlers learned and like wrestled like everywhere. And that was always one of my goals was like, I was like, all right, you know, U.S., you know, obviously they're like, you know, U.S. and like Canada, like Mexico, Japan, uh, um, England. Those are like the four big ones. Obviously, mm -hmm. dozens of hundreds of other countries. But those are like always like the four or five like big ones where I was like, these are the places like I, I'm going to wrestle in the U.S. Obviously, I got to get to Canada. I got to get to Mexico, Japan and like England. Those are like I got to check all those off the boxes. And I had mm -hmm. everyone but Mexico. And I was like, I got to get down to Mexico somewhere. I got to get down to Mexico. And I'm glad I got to finally like check all those off because those are all places that my favorite wrestlers wrestle. Like, you know, like that's where Jericho wrestled, like Eddie wrestled, you know, like, you know, Edge and Christian, like, like, uh, like everybody, like, yeah, even like, like, like Liger as well. Like Liger, like went to all those places. Like he went to Stampede. He went to uh, England uh, for World of Sport. He went down to Mexico. And like Liger is like my favorite wrestler. You can see the the poster right there. Yeah. The yeah. The poster like, right yeah, above your uh, shoulder there. Absolutely. Was, yeah. My all time um, wrestler. And that was all the places he went. Yep. And now did you get to work with him directly at any yes. point? Yes. And, yes yeah. So uh, I, I, I knew there was something there, um, you know, having, you know, been following your career for the last few years. Uh, I'll tell the story about the first time I ever saw you wrestle, um, which happened to be wrestling live. Um, but did you, did you get to work with him? Did he give you any, you know, any coaching yes. tips or anything like that? So how was that for you? So you have a legend <laughs> and I don't know of there. A lot of guys like to call themselves a legend and it doesn't matter what sport you're in. Um, and that's great. You can have all sorts of accolades, but when you're talking legend, we are talking for the hockey guys out there. We're talking like a, a Mario Lemieux, Yaramir Yager, yeah. Steve Eiserman level guy. We're yeah. talking your, your, your Mike Tyson level, your, he is up there yes. and he is Absolutely. not only good, really, really good at what he yeah. does. He did it for a really long time. Cause he retired uh, he last year, the year before? Right before, no, right before COVID started. Twenty, right? There was like a my friend that's like a meme. She actually sent me the other day. It was like, um, he Liger retired January twenty twenty, and then the whole world went to shit once Liger retired because COVID started <laughs> right after that. <laughs> I'll let you know. You know what? Correlation there. I'll co-sign that. I I agree. Um, but so, what was it like learning? So this is this is you know showing up to practice and having you know Wayne Gretzky yes uh, hop on the ice with you. This is like going to the gym and getting sparring with Mike Tyson. So what was it like learning from that level? Because you'd already been coaching and uh, yeah, yeah. and teaching at this point. So, and that's one of the things I find really fascinating about you is. You're also you're out going to Mexico and you know seeking the extra coaching and training yes. but while you're passing it on. So tell me about working with the legend himself. Uh going just real quick before that, like yeah, what you were saying, like about still I still like am a student of wrestling for sure. Mm -hmm. Like I still want to learn, and that's only gonna make me a better coach by be like, hey, I want to go learn from someone else. Like I've been a coach for X amount of years, but like I want like I don't know everything. I'll tell my students that like I don't know everything, but I'm gonna still go out and seek knowledge and I wanna be an example for them of like you see me, I'm thirteen years in wrestling. I've you know wrestled in all fucking everywhere, you know. Um and I'm like I still wanna learn. I'm still trying to like learn. Um so I wanna be that example. But man, go back to Liger, like, you know, people say like don't meet your heroes, but I adamantly disagree. Like, um mm -hmm. to me he is the epitome of what I think a legend is in terms of not just having the status of being everywhere, but someone with the longevity and the match quality to back it up. But the biggest thing about him is just like how humble and like helpful he is. Um, and just like, he is like one of the nicest people, like will give you the shirt off his back and like is absent and, and wants to help the, the younger generation so much. Um, quick, quick story actually. So the first time I met Liger, uh, Ring of Honor brought him in, uh, in like uh, May of 2014. Uh, mm -hmm. to Toronto actually. Uh, we had the new, we brought this is the first shows we did with the New Japan guys. So we brought in like 10 guys from Japan, like a lot of top stars, like Liger, like Okada, like Nakamura, Tanahashi, like a bunch of guys. And we had two shows. It was uh, one on a Saturday in Toronto 
and then the following Saturday in New York City. So um, I was still. Uh, oh, yes. I, yeah. 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 I remember these. So okay. I was keep in going. Toronto, and I remember I was like, holy crap, like Ring was bringing Liger. And this is like my idol, like my favorite wrestler, like the reason, like one of the reasons I became a wrestler. And I remember like I was still in like Ring Crew at the time for like those that don't know Ring Crew. It's just like I helping set up the ring and things like that and like doing like work during the shows and having different jobs and everything. But I remember like whatever job I was doing, I was like, Liger's making his entrance. I sprinted to the top. Of mm-hmm. the bleachers at the Ted Reeve Arena, which is uh, like a big hockey uh, hockey arena, um, Ted Reeves Arena in Toronto. I sprint to the top of the bleachers. I'm like, I'm recording his entrance. I am not missing this. So, like, I'm just like sitting there, just like a little kid, just like recording Liger making his entrance. I'm like freaking out. And then, funny enough, uh, Mark Briscoe was the first person to introduce me to the New Japan guys because like they had their own separate locker room. And then Mark Briscoe was like, "Hey, cheeseburger, come here." He's just like, he goes up to New Japan guys. He's like. Hey guys, like this guy's name is like Cheeseburger. And they were like laughing. They thought that was funny. He like introduced me to everyone. They were like, hey, nice to meet you, Cheeseburger. Like it's like all of like that whole thing. Um, so then that was that Saturday. Then the following uh Sunday, I drove back like eight hours from Toronto with like me and the, my my band of people. Um I remember I was getting back home, I was super tired, exhausted. We've been driving like this is like b- before I was like getting like flights and stuff, like to show. Mm-hmm. So we were like driving like uh, like eight, 10 hours from Toronto. And I was like, just about to get home. And then it's actually my trainer delirious. He messaged me. He's like, Hey man, like, I know you just, you guys just got back from uh, Toronto, but like, I really need, like, I really need your help. Like uh, the new Japan guys are coming into the airport in Philadelphia at this time. And I need someone like to help me pick them up. Like, do you mind like helping me pick them up? And I was like, ah, I really want to go to sleep. I really want to do this. So but I was like, you know, what? like that's my trainer. Like I'll, I'll help mm-hmm. you back out, you know? Um, so I went and like, uh, I went to like go help pick them up. And I met the New Japan guys again, and they remember me because of my name was Cheeseburger and everything. And we took them to the hotel, and there some of the, it was like kind of late, but some of the guys were like, "Hey, um, do you mind like taking us out to eat?" Uh, so like, I was like, "Yeah, sure, no problem." So I remember like this funny. It was like I took them out. They wanted to go to IHOP. Uh, they they, they wanted to go to IHOP of all places. So I took them to IHOP, and I remember I was like, there was like eight of us. Uh, there was like four people at one table, and there's like three people at the other table with like one empty seat. And I was just like. Am I supposed to sit with them or should I just sit at another table? Like, should I? Like, I, I was like, I was like, well, I guess I got to sit. I was, I was like, I want to be like that weird guy that like just intrudes, but also don't want to mm-hmm. sit alone because that's also kind of weird. So I was like, I didn't know what to do because I didn't know like how they like if they would mind if I sat, sat with them or not. So I just like sat down and it was like a table of like me, uh, Ghetto, uh, Okada, and like the New Japan president. And I'm just like sitting there, just like. <laughs> This is so weird. I feel so hey, uncomfortable. Um, if you're gonna and, sit down anywhere, sit yeah. down next to the president of the company. Yeah, I, um, I was like this is so uncomfortable. Like, but here I am. Um, and then Okada, like, he speaks very good English, and he started talking to me and uh, Ghetto as well. And like, they were talking to me, and, and Okada's like, "Oh, who's your favorite wrestler?" And I was like, uh, "Liger wasn't at the dinner. He stayed at the hotel. It's like sleep." So I remember I was like, "Ah, it's actually like it's actually Liger." And Okada's like, "Oh, like, uh, like that's like uh, Liger's your favorite wrestler." And then um. Then where I've just kind of built a camaraderie with the guys, and I the next day they're like, "Hey, can you want can you take us to go see the Rocky statue in uh in Philly?" Mm-hmm. I was like, "Yeah, sure." So I took them to see the Rocky statue, and then the next day Liger was there for that trip, and I got to like you know t- chat with him, kind of hang out with him for the day, and all the other guys, and they were all super nice and super great. And the following day, that Tuesday, uh, Liger gave me like a New Japan shirt with like his autograph on it because the guys had told him like he was my favorite wrestler, and I have it still in like my closet at home. It's like uh, it just says like thank you, and like has like a little drawing of like his like mask in there. And then we just, that was kind of like how we first kind of like became like friends. And then I remember like we did a, a trial camp the, the following day after that, that Wednesday. And Liger, for people that don't know, like one of his signature moves is like a palm strike. Uh, and I tried to mm-hmm. do his palm strike in front of him. He was at the trial. I tried to do his palm strike in front of him and it went like horribly wrong. And I remember one of the guys go up there like, hey, do you want like Liger to like teach you how to do it properly? I was like, I was like, you think he would? And they're like, yeah, let's go ask him. So he brought me over to ask him. Like, hey, can you teach him like your palm strike? And he's like, Yeah, right there. He just showed me like the proper technique of doing the move and everything. And Ring of Honor, I told I saw that story to uh to my boss at Ring of Honor. They're like, hey, let's like film like let's let's have you guys do this again and film it and make it like a, a promo. So mm-hmm. if you look on YouTube, you can see Liger teaching me the palm strike in the promo the same way he taught me like like uh like out of like uh, like off camera. And that kind of like was the start of our like off-screen relationship, but also our on-screen relationship. And then 
from there when he would come, we would do like tag matches together and he would give me advice after the tag matches and we would do like trios matches and things like that. I never got to have a match against him, which I'm really sad about before he retired, but we did a bunch of tag matches, trios matches. Uh, we worked together a lot. And last story I'll, I'll say before I get too long with it. And, um, my first trip to Japan in 2016, um, it was in the Tokyo Dome, which is huge. And that's, I can talk for like an hour about that, but uh they had like uh like a lot of like it's like in a giant baseball stadium so like there's like a bunch of like separate like locker rooms like the americans are over here japanese tile over here the good guys bad guys are separated and there's like a big locker room with like all the, like the baby face like japanese talent and i was in the the rumble and they were ready to put the rumble together and i was like on the other side of the arena with the americans so one of the young lines came is like hey they need you for the rumble so like i go to the they bring me to their side and then i remember there's just like a door leading to the locker room and he just kind of like motions at the door i'm like Okay, I guess I'm just gonna go in. So I, I remember opening the door and stepping in. And you ever see like those movies where you you know the means there's like the record scratch, like freeze frame, and you mm-hmm. feel like everyone's looking at you. I felt like that in that moment. I walked into this locker room, there's like 30 people in there. I walk in, I step in, I swear it feels like everyone like stops talking and immediately just turns and is like, Who the fuck is like who is this guy that just walked in? <laughs> and I felt like I was standing there for like an eternity, which is everyone just looking at me. I was like uh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And then Liger like stands up in front of the whole locker room and like says like, "Hey everyone, like this is like this is Cheeseburger from Ring of Honor. Like he's in the Rumble. Like and he like brought me around the locker room and introduced yeah. me to all like the the biggest like the stars of like, Japan that I've seen mm-hmm. just like YouTube and TV and stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh my god, I'm meeting this person, this person. Everyone's like super cool because like Liger, you know, was the guy. So he like introduced me to everybody. I was like, oh my god, thank God, like this is fucking crazy. Yeah. So I admit that meant a lot that he did that for me. That's see, that's fantastic. That is giving back on a level that a lot of guys don't do. And sometimes it's their, their it's not in their personality. And sometimes it's just they've never had the opportunity. Yeah. And there's a lot of, and it doesn't matter what form of athletics or you know, even life. Some people just are incapable of teaching mm-hmm. and you know they can they can do it but they couldn't explain how or why they did it it's like yes. well why why like let's let's take it back to our, our fan base here it's like well how do you, you you get so much you get so much force on that wrist shot it's like oh i just you know just flick it like this so, yeah but yeah. how do you what's the thing going it's like i i don't know i just i just flick it that's, like this that's the thing sometimes the best players like and you see us in the i i, I don't really follow hockey but i have an actually no. you actually just went to your first game recently did that's you what not? i was gonna tell you about I actually yeah. went to my first hockey game yeah um uh, and actually one of my i went there because one of my students uh was playing in the game uh um, okay and like one another one of my students so like where the school is located at there's like a hockey arena that is like literally right across the street um and mm-hmm. we're in bristol pennsylvania there's like this hockey arena and i've been training i've been as a student as a trainer in this building for 13 years i've never been to a hockey arena across the street um and i remember a couple years ago they renovated it they made it look real nice on the outside i was like i never just i just never crossed my mind to like go there and then one of my students like oh yeah i saw uh, such and such play like he I was like oh where's he playing at? and like in philadelphia like no, right across the street from the school. Like, it's, it's free to go. I'm like, wait, what? Like, that's like, he's playing across there. Like, yeah, I'm going next Sunday. You want to come? I'm like, sure. So we went and, like, I walked in. It's, the place was huge. They had, like, two full-size, like, rinks in there. It was gigantic. I was like, wow, mm-hmm. this is, like, insane. And I went and uh, he's in, like, an adult, like, hockey league. And they're uh, they're playing. And I popped up and surprised him. He's like, holy crap. Like, you're, like, you're here. Like, I'm like, yeah. Like, I just came to surprise him, like, support the team. And it was, it was awesome. It was, I had a really fun time watching it. That, that's fantastic. You know, we'll get you to a get you to a Flyers game. If maybe we can get you booked up here, we'll take you to see the old Canucks play. And they're they're not doing I, so bad right now, but it, it's the Canucks, so I, I don't want to jinx it. Fun fact: because, I actually I did watch hockey when I was a kid. I never went to a game. I mm-hmm. watched it as a kid a little bit, and I had a jersey. I was a big fan of the, the Devils of uh the goalie uh Brodeur. Brodeur. Yes, I had his jersey when I was a kid, in like oh yeah. like two thousand or two thousand one or something yeah that's you know he was he was a badass goalie i mean he's he's got the rings and the gold medals to prove it he was he was he's one, like of one of those guys time, right what's that one of the best of all time like goalie was? oh absolutely oh yeah, yeah absolutely right. in that in that conversation i mean it's uh it's it's a long and and 
illustrious list in there, yes. but you cannot talk about great goalies, especially in the 90s and early 2000s without saying Martin okay, Brodeur. Yeah, I picked the, I picked I the mean, good player of the like. That's good. Yeah, you absolutely did. I mean, and, uh, you know, I was a big Penguins fan when I was a kid. I loved watching Mario and Yager play, and I thought that was fantastic. And I, you know, know, I, I do know his name, yeah. It's uh, it, it's one of those things. I don't get to the hockey games as much as I thought. And actually, here's something with my dad. And we had Jeff Cortnell on the show uh, a couple months ago now. Everybody can check out episode three for that one. Um, my dad was one of these trainers, and he had all these stories. And I'd tell stories to my friends. It's like, well, I mean, the, if you know, why don't you go to more games? I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know. So it sounded like, or shit. This guy's yeah, yeah. buying his dad's nonsense. Now, I had met him personally, and I remember it. And so I knew it wasn't nonsense, but what my dad had finally told me just earlier this year is he followed a lot of his players uh, very closely through their careers, which is why he never had a favorite hockey team mm. because one of his guys is going to be playing against them. So it's like, no, nope, yes. I just like the game. I like watching my guys. I like watching the individual players because, you know, it's fandom is great, but sometimes you you change your shirt and the fans don't like you so much. Ask Tom Brady, right? He is not, he is not as beloved in Boston and new England as he used to be in to yep. some degree, but he would get offered tickets all the time. He's like, I think I actually alienated a bunch of people because I would never take the tickets. And uh, I, yes. I worry that they, they thought like I didn't remember them or I didn't care. I didn't want to go see him. It's like, I just, I know how it works. They got to pay for those tickets. So if they're giving us a bunch of tickets, that's coming out of their pocket. It's like, well, mm, they, they, they're kind of willing to, this is them giving back to you. He's like, yeah, I, I realized that a few years back and I just, uh, I didn't want to, and I'm like, which was a shame because Jeff was playing when Vancouver was doing really well. He was, mm, uh, he was on the team that caused us to burn down Vancouver the first time when they came <laughs> second in the league. Um, so and, and that's that was sort of his philosophy is I'm here to lift you up. I don't I don't want to take back. I've yeah. I've put my time in. I'm giving back. I gave back to get you there. Um so it's it, I don't know, it was just one of those things where it's yeah. like, really cool. So you you're turning down the ticket. You're turning down the tickets. <laughs> awesome. Right, right. But I mean, that's that's just his moral compass. And there's there's a lot of ways, as you know, over the last few years, I've gotten to know you that your mentalities are fairly safe. You don't generally get um, now. I was really good at bringing it out of my dad, but I don't think I've ever seen you smoking mad. Um, oh, no, it's very it very rarely happens. And you're you're very big on coaching the person from what I've seen. Cause I got, I did get to spend some time at your school one night, um, you know, about a year and a half ago, seeing how, you know, you interact with your, your students, your trainees yep. and how they interact with you. And it was a lot like seeing uh, my dad in the locker room. Mm -hmm. It was the same sort of, okay. So now a little bit different. Cause one of them was trying to smack the shit out of you earlier that evening, but um, oh. you know, <laughs> It, it it's just one of those things where it's like okay so you got like you were saying earlier you have this outside life going on here's what you did um you know it, here's what you did here we could improve this here this was really good that's fantastic and it's a lot of building on the positives which i think you know having watched my dad and seeing it in a few other places and seeing you it's probably one of the things that really makes you a top-notch trainer or coach or however you want to put it especially in a complex business like yours because we've sort of danced around it a couple of times but pro wrestling and mm -hmm. um I, I i don't like the term smart mark because it generally means you're an obnoxious prick i prefer calling myself an educated fan because i do yes. listen to a lot i read a lot of the books um you know i I, I've sat in a room with, you know, you and two other professional wrestlers talking about the business and I'm just enjoying the conversation. Yeah, and yeah. I think at, at one point um, I interjected saying, it's like, look, as a fan, I don't want to see that any more than you guys want to see your people. Like, I think I don't remember the, it was two big dudes. I, actually, I think it was Will Hobbs and Keith Lee and had a thing on TV. Hmm. And it's like, and you guys are like, I don't understand why they did this. And I'm like, I didn't, as a fan, I didn't want to see it that way either. 
I, mm-hmm. I thought they just and but just listening to that whole thing, it's your demeanor is really, really well suited for this kind of role you've chosen for yourself. And I think it, you know, obviously started somebody saw it back in, you know, when you're 17, 18 years yeah, old, yeah. because you can't throw somebody in there that's going to get super frustrated and just start yes. yelling the first time. It's like, no, that's not how I told you to do it this way. Like, that doesn't yeah. work. I mean, I see that in my job. We have um, one particular dude that's like, I told you how to do this. And then if you don't do it right the second time, it, is it, there's actually two of them. But um, yeah. it's it's the world has come crashing in and you you received all the training you needed to do this properly. So you told me once. That's like... <laughs> The biggest thing with especially why i'm very picky on who i allow to like be a coach in my system mm-hmm. as well um because we had a couple of like just not a whole lot but like people like that have, have been like coaches and stuff here um i'm very particular about who i let like coach my students because mm-hmm. i want someone that you know i don't want someone that teaches the exact same way as me because that would just kind of defeat the purpose i feel like mm-hmm. but someone that definitely has a similar demeanor and someone that isn't going to that someone that wants to teach not that was that was what I'm looking for, like someone that wants to, yeah, like you said, teach the individual, not just like teach at people, mm-hmm. but like actually like teach them and want them to be better and want and is willing to like explain to them things. Um, have the patience. Patience is like the key, I think, of, of being a good coach. Um, and I'm very particular about like who I let like teach my students because you know I know how I want things to be run here and like the mm-hmm. environment that I want to cultivate here and the community I want to cultivate here. And I don't want someone to come in that has the opposite, like, values of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, like, the biggest thing is just, like, we – I don't like – I don't necessarily like using the term, like, family because sometimes, especially in, like, wrestling context, that can get, like – people use that as, like, a word to, like, exploit people by saying, oh, we're a family, but I'm just going to, like, take advantage of you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, um, I, it, yeah, you, you I, I don't like to use that word because it's been like so many times in wrestling, people have been like burned by places that have used that word, you know. But I do feel like we have like an environment in the community that we have cultivated and that I've been trying to cultivate since like I was in Ring of Honor and I've tried to, especially in this building, um, I tried to keep that same environment that I learned in Ring of Honor that I had around Ring of Honor, like here at the Worldwide Dojo. Um, and I don't want that to be compromised by like anyone, whether it's like a student that is causing issues or like uh, by a coach, especially not by a coach, because then, you know, especially with like how things are, people, if if, uh, if I have another coach and they do something that reflects on me in the school and that that's a whole that's a whole mess. So mm-hmm. um, uh, and people I've, I've selected that have been coaches here have all been fantastic and all been like very good. Uh, so I feel like I've been doing a good job of like finding people that fit what we're the values that we like to have at the school. Yep. And you know, you do, I mean, you, you made one no promise, but you do promise they a certain level of training. You yes, are yeah. going to do it safe. You're going to get the fundamentals and it's going to be knowledgeable. If you have somebody coming yes. in, that's not going to do that. You're compromising, you know, the words you have put out there as your yes. school's motto. And that's yes. fantastic. And you also, you does that extend to when you're bringing in, um, a, for lack of a better term, like a guest coach when you're running oh, a yeah, seminar yeah. by somebody else? Because I've seen you bring in, run some seminars. I see oh, yeah, all your stuff through my through my socials, um, and you've got some pretty interesting names that have run through there. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah, that makes know. me wonder more about the coach, the current coaching culture. Um, in the modern day wrestling training, uh, as opposed to the horror stories that, you know, some of the guys that are now hall of famers and retired have had to say, and I'm sure there's some out there that are going through it now. No, that when I bring in like a guest coach, I love, I love bringing in seminars uh, because I've learned so much from like different seminars throughout like my time, like guest coaches and being able to bring in someone uh, like for, as a guest coach for my, my students is like incredible. Um, and but usually if I'm bringing someone in as, as a guest coach, it's either someone I know personally mm-hmm. um, that I know, like their personality and like what they're about and their values and how they teach uh, or it's someone that someone I know knows that like can speak highly of them. Um, like very rarely have I ever brought in. I don't think I've ever brought in a, someone for a seminar that I didn't like personally know or someone that 
didn't that knew them like i, I don't think i've ever been you like hey like for, this like right? be like legend let me hit you up for a seminar you know because sometimes yeah. my biggest thing too seminars are a money investment too um and they can range anywhere between like 40 50 60 bucks so on the higher end if you're getting like a real top name like WWE person like you know a hundred dollars maybe it's just like a couple of day camp mm -hmm. like 150 and when I talk to people about seminars and just like, I like to get feedback on seminars for like from people like, or if I know some, a friend of mine that is going to a seminar that maybe I can't attend, like at another place, I'll say, Hey, how's this seminar? Like, what did you think about it? Like, did you like it? Do you feel like you got your money's worth? Things like that. And I hate hearing that someone felt like they didn't get their money's worth for a seminar. Um, right. Like I've heard so many stories of like, they're like, yeah, we did this like seminar. I paid like a hundred bucks to learn from this WWE legend. And he like, we like, we just like, you know, like talk the whole time or did like a Q and a, which is helpful, but you know, I don't want to spend a hundred dollars just to do a QA from someone. I want to kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, I want to get like a good mix of everything. I want to like get in the ring and learn some stuff from them, or at the very least, like do drills for them to evaluate and then like, you know, maybe mm -hmm. talk at the end. But, um, or it's like, hey, like I spent like this much money and we just did like this one drill that was like, you know, didn't really like help me much, you know? Um, but like, I just I want everyone to like make sure to get their money their money's worth. So I always I I pick people that I personally want to learn from and feel like I get something from. You know, and I'm not saying like a seminar where you just talk the whole time is like bad, but you know, there's some where it's like you want. Sometimes those are seminars where like you can tell the people just are doing it for the the yeah the check or the money. Um, for an example, one of the best seminars we ever did was our first seminar with Chris Hero, and that was all just talking. But Chris, Chris talked for like seven hours at that seminar. Um, we had I, like, that's actually a name I was hoping you were going to bring up because I, I obviously never met the man, but he's got a wonderful reputation of oh, being a top-notch coach. He, he um, um, he's one of the best ever. He's one of my he had one of my favorite seminars we ever did because we it was very last minute too how it all came about, but uh. I announced the seminar. It was like a with like six days notice because we finally like had to, mm -hmm. everything figured out like six days before, and it sold out like thirty people like within like a few hours, which never happened before. I was like, oh wow, this is crazy. Um, and Chris like he t like he told everyone like, hey, this is just gonna be just um just talking, but it wasn't just like he was like I say he wasn't talking at people. It was like he he went through every single person in the class and was like, hey, what's your name? Like how long have you been wrestling? Like blah blah. He and the thing about that I love about Chris is when he's talking to you, especially in a room in, in a room for people like he has your like you have his full attention. Like he is like he is focused on you. He's listening. He is listening. Like he's not just like looking. He's listening. Um, and he went through every person in the class like uh, how long you've been wrestling. Like, what's your name? Like, tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, and what do you hope to like gain from the seminar? And he went through every single person and then he went through them again. I was like, all right, what do you fear your strengths are? And what do you fear your weaknesses are? And then every person their weaknesses, he tried to like you know, coached them up and was like, Hey, here's what, um, like, here's something that I think can help this. There's something I think can help with this. Um, here's a good strong suit. Here's something that you like, he just, he went through everyone individually and he told people, was like, Hey, look, I'm just going to like talk. So like, if anyone needs to go, like, I'll get to you first and you can leave. Um, but like we have scheduled for three hours. He legit stayed for seven hours and talked. And that's fantastic. Now, it did, did you pick up some tips on just coaching and and building people up like that from seminars with these guys. Yeah. Cause obviously when you're bringing them in, I mean, you're still an active performer, you're yes. active talent. Um, so it, there's, there's a wonderful double edged sword for you of, I get to learn my craft, but I also get to learn how to coach and train better. So that, that's yeah. a fantastic double-edged sword for you. So, yes. I mean, do you, do you start picking stuff up, like, you know, obviously from, as you were saying, from Chris and, you know, from Liger. So you've picked up some stuff along the way there as well, yeah? Fair? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's one of the, that's, again, though, I like, with the seminars, I like to bring people that I know and I want to learn from as well. Because mm -hmm. that's just going to, like, you know, because I, I also don't want to bring someone in and be like, man, this person, bringing this person, it was like a waste of time, you know, like, uh, especially like if I'm like paying to have them there, I'm like, I want to get my money's worth as well. Uh, so it's like, I want, I, I feel like we've had a really good track record of like really good top quality seminars and like every single one I'm taking, I'm there taking notes and I'm learning stuff. I'm like, all right, I can apply this to training, like whether it's just something they say or like a drill they do. Like, I'm just like constantly trying to learn and like improve myself as a coach. So yeah, these seminars have been a huge, huge help. Yeah, that's and that's fantastic. I think you have just such a wonderful setup there. You have this figured out. I mean, you were able to keep this going through the dark times of COVID. 
yeah. as well, right? So. Like that's yeah, so. that's a big deal. I mean, I was there sort of at the tail end of COVID mm -hmm. uh, as we were yep. all sort of being able to open up and, you know, be out and and doing things again and obviously traveling because I I'm in Vancouver and you're not. Um, so it, that's you you survived something that knocked a lot of people on their ass um worldwide doesn't matter the 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 sport or the business yes. or anything but you managed to keep your athletic school going mm -hmm. which is fantastic and that's really a testament to not only you as a businessman but uh, being able to still cultivate these students that are like yeah you know what i'm gonna keep going with this mm -hmm. so that's that was, um, man, that was a rough period uh just in terms of like well, we had we shut down, you know, for the first, you know, for months when mm -hmm. everything else shut down, yep. and we were like the last school to stop wearing masks. Like, um, but like I, I was like I took as many precautions as I had. Like, students would get have to get tested every two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. that we we trained in masks, which like people people from other schools would like say stuff about that. Be like, oh, like why are you guys like training in masks? I'm like. I mean, I'm just taking it across. We would do temperature checks before training as well. Like I would check everyone's temperature. Just tell them you're you're training. You're it's high altitude simulation yeah. for Mexico and Denver. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, but like to this day, and I, we were one of the only like, and there's like a couple of major schools. I won't name names, obviously, but a couple of major schools that I know of that had COVID outbreaks, and we were one of the mm -hmm. only few like major schools that I know of that didn't have a COVID outbreak because we took those precautions. Um, like among the students, I mean, um, yeah. Uh, like in terms of like a bunch of people getting sick in the, at, at the same time, like we did not have a single like big COVID outbreak um, because we took those precautions. And also like, um, I think just the students appreciate that even that they hated it at first, like just because like, you know, it was like, hey, this is what we got to do. And we're going to do this until everything's like fully safe. And we did that for a long time. And yes. you know, obviously like things are opening up like other schools like to stop and like we're going to keep doing this for like an extra like six, seven, eight months, however long this takes to make sure like everything's like good. Um, Cause then there'd be times when people kind of loosen up on restrictions and then they start getting sick. I was like, we're not, nope, we're not, we're leaving the mask. I was like, all right, we'll get rid of the mask at this time. Oh, another big outbreak. Nope. We're keeping them on for like six more months. Like we're not getting mm -hmm. rid of them. Um, the biggest thing though, is like, like you said, because we all wore masks, like when we took them off our cardio, everyone's cardio at the school was absolutely amazing. Yeah, I yeah, I believe that. I, it's the first thing I thought I was like, oh man, that's that must be just amazing for the cardio and the prep. Um, so we're about an hour. So I just I, I want you to tell because I've heard this uh years ago before Jericho Cruise won, because you were talent on that. Um the story of how you got your name. Mm -hmm. But before we go into that, I want to, and I don't know if I've told you this or not. the The story of the first time I saw you wrestle live. Mm -hmm. So Jericho Cruz won. For those of you that don't know, it's fantastic. Yeah, Love it's it. They, it's it's my non wrestling fan wife <laughs> insists we go every year right now, um, and it's part part that we've met a bunch of people and the part that it's super fun if you don't like wrestling then if you know of a something you're a fan of that has a theme cruise go on it yes anyway so i'm leaving the bar one afternoon shocking um i get the drink package and i use it and a match had just gotten into the ring and i i was in a conversation in the bar with somebody else and i i didn't quite hear what was going on but i'm walking along the upper deck which overlooks the ring and i hear a voice that i had spoken to a couple hours beforehand and got a photo with and i was really excited to see the match and this voice said ain't nobody want to see cheeseburger die here tonight <laughs> oh, and i no, and i did it i did the full cartoon thing my body and my drink kept going my head went no nope, this is what we're doing <laughs> um so I, I turned around stopped and i watched that match uh you and jay briscoe ah, and yes, was... uh you know <sighs> rest in peace jay yeah, it's yeah, rest been peace. almost a year what what an amazing talent and yeah. now it, i wanted to tell the story before we get into your name because you're you're not the wrestler like a lot of people think pro wrestler they're thinking six mm -hmm. six jack to the tits yeah, yeah. 350 Absolutely. you're somewhat smaller yes to say the least uh, funny story um, actually uh real quick not to cut you off but like go ahead um, one time like when i first switched to uh like i had like a my first like leather jacket with like fur on it 
Um, I messaged uh, Killer Customs, the same lady that met, that does a lot of Jericho's gear, like his mm-hmm. like tights, and, like his jackets and stuff, and, like for him and the band, and a bunch of other bands and things like that. And I remember I messaging her for like a, a jacket because I'd seen her her work around. She she did gear for like the Wyatt family, like everybody. Um, so I messaged her for a jacket and like we talked. And I sent her. I remember sending her my measurements, and she sent me an email back saying, "Hey, are these measurements correct? Because the measurements that you sent me." Are like the measurements that like you would have for like a like small like like a like a a woman, not like a big like wrestler. And I was like, no, that's me. Here's a picture of me. This is what I look like. She's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my god, it's okay. Yeah. So I remember that was like one of our first interactions. Is like she's like, yeah, your measurements are the, the measurements you I would have like you know if I was doing like a woman client, not like a big wrestler. I'm like, no. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but sorry, continue. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, my thing was I had, I had see you were on the cruise. I had recognized your name from you know seeing Ring of Honor stuff here and there, and I heard you on talk as Jericho before the cruise because Chris ran through a bunch of the ROH guys so that you know the people on the cruise that may like me that's living out here in the. I mean, we're getting better, but we don't exactly we're not a hotbed for professional wrestling out here. Um, and it's like oh oh. Oh, this this poor man is get oh he and I thought like, oh yeah no the the I'd seen Briscoe stuff and I'm like oh oh my and it was a great match it it really was I was very, absolutely very, very impre- I was very impressed with it um I still have and you can find it on YouTube you can look up the Sea of Honor tournament and you can see this exact match I'm talking about mm-hmm. I'm just a little bit out of the shot as my head spun around and turned but i know exactly where i was standing i could show you um if i were on the boat i could show you exactly where i was standing to watch it um but it it was one of those ones was like oh this this should be nice and quick we're just gonna no it wasn't um Mm -hmm. it was it was a good solid match i mean it didn't go on for an hour but i still will go back on the sea of honor tournament when i run through that just for shits giggles and memories it's like nah i gotta watch not just because you know, now we've through mutual friends have gotten to know each other a bit, not just because you're my buddy, but because I really thought that was one of the better matches on the boat that year. It, I mean, it really was. I mean, that's, that and that's not, you know, you're buffing your nuts for no apparent reason. That's because <laughs> I was legitimately impressed. Yeah, yeah. that man. And that then, was, that was a fun time. Sorry. And so if, if real quick, as we're going to wrap up, um, tell the folks exactly how you got your ring name. Um, so yeah, this is like the number one question I always get like asked, like every interview when people first meet me is always how do you get the name Cheeseburger? So I, when I started training in 2010, I was 17 years old and I was like still in high school at the time. So I, and I was like, I was always a skinny kid. So I was like, at the, when I started training for wrestling, you know, like, like you said, you have images of these wrestlers, these giant guys. Uh, when I started training, I was like 115 pounds, like 17 years old. I was tiny. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also, fun fact, a lot of people don't know this about me. I actually started training to be a manager for wrestling at first. Um, mm-hmm. Like I joined the school and signed up as a manager because I was like, in my head, I was like, I'm too small to be a wrestler, but I still want to be a wrestler. So maybe I could be a manager. And then what I didn't know was like the managers had to do all the same training as the wrestlers anyway. So when I started doing the actual wrestling training, uh, I started being like, oh, maybe I can do this. And like, I'm having fun doing this. This is really cool. And my trainers were like, yeah, we think that would be a good decision to be a wrestler instead of a manager. Um, that this kind of how that journey happened. But in terms of being called Cheeseburger, um, at that time with the students, with like the older students that are around, like everyone, the new students will always kind of have nicknames. Um, like we had a kid named like Moppy, for example, like he had like brown, like it dark moppy hair and everything. They weren't super creative, but yeah, that was that was we had moppy. Yeah, I'm and just like pull this out of the way for a second. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, like they would give like new students like nicknames and stuff like that. Cause you know, generally too, like a lot of the new students, like because wrestling training is so hard. A lot of them like wouldn't stick around very long, so sometimes people mm-hmm. like, I'm not even going to learn this person's name. I'm just gonna give them a nickname, you know, because uh, they might not be around that long anyway. But mm-hmm. um, my first road trip, before my first road trip, we were going to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, for two tapings at the OVW Arena for Ring of Honor. Uh, we were loading up the ring in the back of the back of the school. We were loading up the truck. Actually, no, we were going to Chicago. That's where we were going. Um, we were loading up the ring, and I remember. Uh, Rhett Titus, who's one of my uh, best friends now in wrestling, uh, mm-hmm. I'd seen him on Ring of Honor for like years and years. And I remember like Rhett came to the school because he's going on the road trip with us. And I remember being like, like, oh crap, that's like Rhett Titus. Like he he trained at the dojo too. And like 
I've seen him on Ring of Honor. I've seen him on pay per view yep. like TV. That's awesome. Like, I was like, okay. Yeah, I, I briefly yeah, talked to him on Cruise One. Um, yeah. in one of those quick interactions, he would never remember. But yeah, yeah. he seemed like a that, and that was That's that was cool. one of the things is he, he was really nice about it. Um, so very, keep very going. Cool. Didn't mean to interrupt uh, you there. No, you're good. Uh, he, so Rhett, I went to say hello to him. So I go, I go up to him, I stick my hand out, and like, like, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Brenda. I'm one of the new students. And he kind of like Rhett just kind of looks me up and down. He kind of like looks. And he's like. Like, man, you need to eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> First thing he says to me, he's like, man, you need a cheeseburger. And like all the other students, like they like turn around, they like pop like huge. They're like, like, oh, they're like, that's his name. That's gonna be his nickname, cheeseburger. And like they're like my first road trip, the their idea to like help me gain weight. You know, right, you got you're gonna be a wrestler, you gotta gain weight. They're like, every time we stop at a rest stop, you're gonna have to like eat a cheeseburger. Uh <laughs> And so, like, oh, thank rest you. stop cheeseburgers that can go one way or the other. <laughs> like, every, every every rest stop we stop at, yeah. Thankfully, it was like super late at night when we left, so like all the places were closed, so I didn't have to do that. Um, but then everyone just started calling me cheeseburger, and that was just my nickname around the locker room. Like, people like everyone spread around that, oh, this guy's named cheeseburger, this is cheeseburger, this is cheeseburger. And then it was in January 2020, uh, 2013. Uh, Charlie Haas was uh, in Ring of Water at the time. He was uh, like the top heel. And he had come out for a segment. And the idea with the segment was going to be, you know, he's cutting a promo. And then, you know, fans are throwing like toilet paper, like trash and stuff. Adam was cutting his heel promo. And I was just a student helping out ringside at the time. So I was going to come in, you know, start getting the junk out of the ring. And then he was going to yell at me on the mic and just like beat me up. And that was the segment. Just like a, just like a segment like for him to be mm-hmm. heel in. So he's doing the promo. And then I get into the ring. I'm starting like grab stuff out. He's like, "Hey, like, what are you doing? Like, getting into my TV time?" He calls me into the ring and like he's yelling at me, blah blah. And then he's like, "You know, hey kid, what's your name?" And I was like, "Oh, my name's like Brenda, sir." He's like, "You know, what? you like you need to eat a cheeseburger. I'm gonna call you cheeseburger." And then like we're in the Dew Burns Arena in, in Baltimore, and there's like 800 people there, and like 800 people just all start chanting like, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheese. And I'm just like, and then he beats me up and the segment happens. So I was just thinking like, all right, it's like a whatever segment. And I get to the back and Delirious, who's like my trainer, but also my boss, he's the booker for Ring Honor. He was like, oh man, we might have to, we might have something with this cheeseburger thing. And I remember being like, oh man, I, I really don't want to be called cheeseburger. Like I hate, I, I hope this doesn't stick. And then just like every time like fans would see me, they would start chanting and when I'd be helping ringside and it just like became my ring name. And it's just like people loved yep. it. So it's, and it now you're world famous. Yeah. It literally just happened by accident. And you know what? That's that's fantastic. And the reason I wanted that story to come out, uh, one of the things that we do hit on a lot around here is um, because of the way hockey works in particular, uh, a lot of kids start traveling and playing for teams as they move up into the, the major junior level. They'll be away from home, but th- some of these kids will be 15, 16 years old. Right. Right. Um, you can go back and you can, for those of us that have been listening, go back, check our Danny Hodgson episode out. 15 years old, went from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, or um, yeah, went from Fort Mac, I think it was. Danny, I'm sorry. I'll get it right next time. Yeah. Anyways, he went from Northern Alberta, uh, you know, small town to a smaller town in the middle of Vancouver Island at 15 years old. Jeff Cortnell, 17 year career, was playing in the same team same time uh three years older but neither one of them had really hit that growth spurt it's just Mm -hmm. there's something about the way testosterone works on us in our teens as as dudes um some of us don't get that dose until we're 1920 oh yeah yeah i was right super super tiny kid at the time and i mean i'm still like small but like i managed to finally put on some weight and gain some muscle just sheer effort to him (laughs) But yeah, yeah, and so and that's like, and 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 that's really it is like it does you can't you can control a lot of things you can control your diet you can control your exercise and workout mm-hmm. routines you can control your passion you can't yeah. control your genetics yes and I whether know. that's whether that's the metabolism you have to adjust for and you have to have a very strict diet or whether that's the fact that you know you're you're 18 years old and you're still five five but you haven't hit that growth spurt yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, hockey in particular, because you can start traveling and getting up there fairly quickly at a very yeah. young age. Some yeah. of these kids are looking at, I mean, they're, they're one step away from the NHL and they haven't really finished their final growth spurt yet. Right. So yeah. it's size 
size doesn't matter as much as your work ethic. And that's one of the big I, things we're, we're big on at this show. And that's another reason why I thought you'd be a fantastic fill in today is because you're living proof. You, there's so many you people, absolutely are. Yeah. There's like, there's so many people that like by all, like, no, like, honestly, I should have like quit to be honest. Cause like, you know, I mm -hmm. was, like, I wanted to quit. I wanted to quit my first day. And it literally was like, thanks to my mom that I did not quit. Like I, I did my first day of training and we didn't even get in the ring. Like we just like, we did like squats, push-ups, like crunches, like just, uh, just constantly, just constantly, constantly. And I, it was like the hardest thing, like at that point in my life I had ever done. Cause like I had done like athletics here and there, like I played basketball a little bit and would play with my friends. I did like karate here and there, but like I had never done anything like that intense. And I was like, not anywhere near in the shape that I should have been for my first day of wrestling training. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking like my heart was about to fucking like explode. I remember like, laying on the couch at the school and telling uh, my chair, I was like, I think something's wrong with my heart. And looking back, I'm so embarrassed by that. And she was like, uh, just go outside and get some air. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was just like sitting on the curb outside. She's like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And I remember like getting in the car after my first day with my mom. And I was like, I told her, like, I don't want to do it. Like, I, I'm not, I can't go back to the next day. I don't think I can do this. And she's like, look, just give it like one more day. Like we're already like, also like, she had just paid a thousand dollar deposit that she couldn't get back. So I think mm -hmm. she was also just like, Hey, like just give it us like another day. You know? Well, I mean, oh. let, let's be honest. You were talking earlier about making sure you get your money's worth out of things. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that seems to have been passed down naturally. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, that's really one of the things that we've been trying to drive home here is don't let your size stop you. You might have to outwork everybody there. You might have to persevere longer than everybody there, but it's not, it's not an end factor. It's yeah. really not. I mean, it's, you know, the NHL is not a hundred percent guys like Zidane Ochara, who's a, you know, a, basically a skating, um, uh, what, oh God, I just blanked on his name. It was, yeah. uh, <laughs> A skating undertaker. Uh, yeah. It's not that it's not the reference I Satnam Singh was the reference I was yes. looking for. He's like a skating Satnam Singh. Um there are there are guys that you know barely make five sex and yeah. are Hall of Fame guys. There are guys that you know aren't quite six feet tall and they are out there Hall of Fame guys, multiple decades in the sport. Um, and that that's true to anywhere, like. Steve Nash really did not fit the profile of what you'd think no. an NBA player not looked at like. Oh, yeah, not at all. Right? You know, like, so uh, that, I, yeah, I was that, the guy that I was like this, I was the smallest guy at the school, smallest guy. I had, it was me and like two other guys that start at the same time. I was the only one that stayed. Um, I would see people bigger than me, like more athletic than me, just drop out. And like people that with that had like real potential that just like would not be able to handle it either from the physical aspect or the mental aspect of it. And just like I was always the person that was every every training session, I was there. I would make sure I was there. I was on time. Uh, you know, gave it my best effort and just like was a sponge. And I was someone that just by all accounts should not have made it to the level that I have in wrestling and the success I had. But just like literally, and I, I didn't even start get working out and getting in shape until like three years ago. And I was like mm -hmm. super skinny, like for even when I was doing like all the cool stuff, I was very small. Uh, but just through sheer passion, just passion, just being around and just like being like learn, willing to learn and like, um, and just not being like the biggest thing I tell people too is just like the most important thing you can be as skilled as you want and like as good as you want, you can be good, just don't be a headache for people. If no one wants to deal with a headache, mm -hmm. if you're a headache, uh, that goes to any sport, like if you're a headache for you, it doesn't matter yep. how good you are, eventually, your goodwill with people, like you're eventually, your level of like being a headache is going to outweigh your skill mm -hmm. and people aren't going to want to deal with you. Like you look at James Harden and like the NBA, like that's the best example. Like, yep. you know, Harden's like, he was like one of the best. And like, now obviously his skills like gone down, but he's just such a headache, such a headache, such a headache. Now people are just like, we don't want to deal with you anymore. Like this is, this is it, you know? Yeah. I mean, and you, you see that, you know, across the board, you, you look at Hollywood actors. It's like, Oh, so-and-so was so good back in, you know, back in the day, what happens? Like, Oh, pain in the ass behind the set. Nobody wanted to put up with their nonsense, Steven Seagal. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, a you know, you see it, you see it anywhere. Um, if you're gonna be a prima donna, better than you, 
sort of human being and just people are going to get tired of your antics and your shit. I mean, I think the exception that kind of proves the rule is Dennis Rodman. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, yeah, he is crazy, but at the very least, he was like a good teammate. Yes. He's crazy. So that's like, yeah. Um, And he also like played his ass off. So that was, that also helped. Well, and that, that's just the thing is, and we discussed Dennis last week on the program um, for all of his antics and all of his, like, particularly uh, we brought up the time that he went and was playing on national TV with Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage rather yes. than going to the Bulls practice during yep, yep. the NBA finals. Yeah. That was um, do you think anybody could have got away with that if they weren't putting in absolute yeah. badass top knot work yeah. every other day you of the have year? To, like, no. You have to, like... Like pe- the thing people don't understand, it's not just is like a wrestling thing, but this is like is a life thing for like mm-hmm. people in like wrestling, sports, even like corporate jobs. Like you have to like build some goodwill before you start like acting off the rails, if I should say. Yep. Uh, not to excuse that behavior, but but like you know, if you're always like an issue, the people aren't gonna want to deal with you. But if you're like someone that's like gone like eight years just doing things the right way and everything, and then like like I, like for example, I, I tell my students uh, one of the best lessons my trainer taught me was like and this could apply to sports as well, you have to learn what battles are worth fighting for and when. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, like, I had, there was something with, like, a recent student where it's, like, they had an issue for, they were on, like, a booked on the show, and they were upset that they were getting, like, a four-minute match where they weren't getting much offense in or, like, losing. And I was, like, and they were saying, like, hey, is this something I should, like, bring up to the promoter? And I was, like, I was, like, honestly, like, no, because it's, like, not that huge of a deal, like, you know, just make the best of it because you agree to the mm-hmm. show. And that's what they want you to do. So do it to the best of your ability. And then like, you know, but like if you this isn't like something that's so huge of an issue that you need to make us think about it. You know, like you're still getting the match. You're getting paid the same. Whether you go four minutes or you go 10 minutes, um, you're getting paid the same no matter how much offense you get. And also this may open up still like a future booking for you for them to bring you back. Like, hey, this mm-hmm. guy did business the right way. We asked him to do this. He did this. So let's reward him with something else. Um, But like if you're like especially because the student was like only like a year in so they haven't really built up that like goodwill yet to be like that guy like hey i'm not happy with my booking decisions i was like you're just going to burn a bridge for something that's not worth burning a bridge for and then what ended up happening was like things got changed around and he went to the show and he had the positive attitude about it but things need to be changed around so he ended up getting like like an eight minute match against someone else that they need to fill a spot for. Fantastic. I, was like, I was like, look, if you would just like brought the situation that you probably wouldn't have got there were like, this guy's a headache. I don't want to deal with them. You know? Um, and I was saying like, if you're someone that like, obviously there's things that are like, you know, if it's like things you were comfortable with or like, you know, uh, criminal things, things like that, like major things, obviously you speak up. Like that's, uh, that's mm-hmm. not what I'm talking about, but just in terms of things like, I'm upset about how much offense I'm getting or like losing to this person. Cause I was like, it's not real. We don't like we actually win and lose. It's right. like the only thing real or the money in the miles is as people say. Um, but like, if you're someone that like, let's say you've gone like 10 years of doing things the right way. And, but when you raise an issue, like, Hey, I have an issue with this. People are going to listen because mm-hmm. they know if you're, if the fact that you're, you feel super strongly enough to speak about this, they know that, there's something in that there's something majorly wrong here and they're gonna listen. But if you're someone that's like every every show, there's like this person has an issue, this person has an issue, this person has an issue, you have an issue with this, there's an issue with this. Then when you have an actual major issue that needs addressing, it's just white noise and people are gonna pay attention to you. Yeah. And that's that that is a, a fantastic point. Is sometimes your role, and you see this in a you know, a lot of professional sports, again, gonna go back to our fan base. Not everybody's the Wayne Gretzky popping the the puck in the net. Not everybody's the Yager or the Bure. Yes. You know, there are guys out there, it's like their sole role is if that guy in the other shirt puts yep. his skates over here, knock him down, yep. keep the puck out of the net. Everybody yep. has a different role. I'm glad Excel that at that up. role and see where it expands to. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm glad you brought that role because, like, people, and this isn't like an insult to people, but people don't understand that some people are star players and some people are bench players. Mm-hmm. Like, for the vast majority of my career, I was a bench player. I was a guy mm-hmm. that was made to make the other guy look good. And then when it finally became my time for me to get some wins and start getting a push, I had done business the right way and I was rewarded with that, you know? Um, some people get that big push throughout the gate. Some people don't. It's just the way it is. And some people are journeymen and their job is just, that's just kind of their role. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean you can't break out of that. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to break out of that, but that just means that's your role for right now. You know, 
And yeah. he, um, and uh, I got, I wish I could remember. I think I wish I could remember who he said. He was either in the NBA. I want to say either Patrick Beverly or Paul George, or I might be combining two different things that they both said. Uh, but one of them was talking at a basketball camp with kids, and they were like, "You have to understand your role." And he was talking about like you have like first things first, play defense. Like you have to play defense because playing being being playing defense will get you on the floor. Like they have to have you on. They mm-hmm. they are going to put you on the floor just solely based off the fact that you can defend their best player. And mm-hmm. then like you could be if you're not a good shooter, you can start working on that and you'll get the ball more. But if you're if you're a good defender, you'll see the floor no matter what. Like there's no like you're just going to mm-hmm. see the floor just by sheer just being a defender. Like they don't need you to score, they just need you to defend the best player. Like you're going to see the floor. And if you can if you can understand that's your role and do that, then other opportunities will uh, open for that. But you can't just be like I'm a star player. I'm not getting my shots. Like, cause that's just like, and I'm not going to play defense and blah, blah, blah. Cause that's not going to work. Like you have to understand this is your role and you can have a job in the NBA for like, you know, 10, 15 years, just by being a really good defensive player that maybe can score here and there. You know? Yep. And that's not, that's not just the NBA either. That's, that's oh, yeah. everywhere. Yeah, that's, yeah. that is absolutely any, anywhere. And I don't just mean in athletics that is in life. If you, play to your strengths, play to the role that you're there for. I mean, in my job, I have a very specific role. Am I going over to load a truck? No. Could I? Probably. Mm -hmm. But my role is over here. Yes, exactly. And that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in your line of work, that role can expand because aside from the athletics, one of the other factors is you are playing a role you do have aspects of you are hired by a director to do this particular role brad pitt was told at one point all we need you to do in this movie is take off your shirt in front of gina davis (laughs) and he was a talking point of thelma and louise and that launched his career Mm -hmm. all he needed to do was say a couple of lines and take his shirt off yeah, but he was like, "Oh, I'm not getting enough. I'm not getting my stuff in. I'm not getting enough lines. I'm not getting enough screen time." I'm like, all right, we'll find someone else to do it. There's always someone. The people, the thing people understand is always, and this goes to sports too. There's always someone mm-hmm. else that can that can do. Unless you're like that top one percent, like you said, like Martin mm-hmm. Berger, Berger, you know, like yep. he has that. He can raise his think about things because no one's taking his job. But yep. if you're a bench player, there's a bunch of guys waiting in the wing. I don't know if hockey has an equivalent to like a G League or like the NBA or whatever, but like, yep. I assume yes. Yeah, and there's people like. Hey, we don't need to. You're the 13th guy on the bench raising issues. Like, see ya. Like, we, we got someone else. Yep. Yeah. You go, we get, you know, call ups and, and, and whatnot from other leagues or, uh, a, you know, a farm system, much like baseball. Yes. yes. Um, so, I mean, you, you might be playing in Cowichan Valley on Vancouver Island one day. You get a phone call and, you know, you're now the in the lineup for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I mean, Vancouver's Vancouver finally wised up and put their farm team actually much closer to my house. I'm I'm southeast of Vancouver in particular, but you know the Canucks are playing down in downtown, but 40 minutes away is their farm team, so all of their guys are right there waiting. If something happens, like you, we need a dude. Um, so, uh, Brandel Cheese, thank you so much for joining us. I think you've hit on all the major points that uh, I we really drive home here. Um, and, and have really shown people that it's not just for hockey. It really isn't. If you're listening to this going, I, yeah, but it's, it's pro wrestling and hockey. I'm a baseball guy. Mm. I'll bet you your coach has a lot of the same philosophies. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, we will be back. Uh, I do have another special guest lined up, ladies and gentlemen. So hopefully we'll get that done next week. Uh, again, from, Bristol, Pennsylvania, I believe it is. Yes. Yep. Uh, you can check out his school and his credits and his alumni there on the uh, worldwide wrestling uh, mm-hmm. If you happen to be listening to me out there, and I know we do have a few people in the area and you're interested, look them up, check them out. Um, and go, you know, go check out a show, go, go mm-hmm. see what's going on out there. Go check out the school, see what's happening. Even if it's uh, uh, not me, just go support independent wrestling in your local area. Like if you've never seen a <laughs> wrestling show, just go one time. Like see if you like it. It's just fun time. Like, you know, it's the same way, like the same thing, like going to a play or to a movie, it's just, except it's more rowdy and way more interactive. So like mm-hmm. go to, find a local independent, just go check them out. And tickets are usually pretty cheap. Yeah. Red wrestling fans are rowdy. I don't know. Hmm, weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, come back, check out. Hopefully, we have our next special guest uh, ready to announce as this hits the hits the airwaves. And on behalf of Doug, who is currently looking for a hockey arena in Cape Town, South Africa, be great because you can. <laughs>